simple act of barter altered the whole balance of life on Nukumanu. There were obvious advantages. Work was easier with steel tools, and the coconut trading still left enough over for food. But for these people, who had no abstract notions of coinage, the trade goods subtly changed their little kingdom. They were no longer self-sufficient. They began to be dependent on the steamer and the goods it brought when it called for the copra. The coconut, the very foundation of the old life, was the instrument which helped destroy this old life and create the new one. In producing their food, the old division of labour continues. The women to the tasks of the garden and the shore, the men to the hunting in the lagoon and on the sea. The products of both land and sea are shared among the whole village, whatever the risk to the individual who won the food. And there are many risks in this calm, clear water. Skill and courage are so common, they're hardly noticed. There are other, less tangible risks than clamshells that could close on a man's arm if he's careless and hold him under till he drowns. There are gods and spirits whose ways must be respected and taboos which must never be broken so that a man of the turtle totem risks disaster should he try to kill a turtle or a man of the clam totem kill a clam. With the clams and the fish and the coconuts, they eat the starchy taru roots which the women grow in the thin soil of Nukumanu. It's a monotonous diet, coarse and rough, but it's all the island will produce. The copra trade has introduced them to European food. They're starting to buy rice with the money they earn. But European food means the slow breakup of a way of life based on fishing and gardening. Twice a year, the wind swings to the opposite quarter of the compass, and with it comes the swing of the seasons, from dry season to wet season. The trade winds are gone, the doldrum days are over, and now the sky darkens. Rain clouds bear down from the northwest, and the monsoon falls on the island, beating it with sharp squalls of rain. The sea breaks high out on the reef, and fishermen pull their canoes far up the beach beyond the reach of the waves. This is the season when people shelter indoors, when eaves drip, water lies in dull pools, things moulder in the damp, and all creatures are dank and miserable. is the chief's son, there are few girls he may marry. Most, by reason of their lineage or their totem, are not fitted to be his wife. On Nukumanu, a chief's choice of wife is not his own. It's 
ruled by the imperative need to find a girl of suitable lineage who will bear him a son, who in his turn will rule the island. If the proper rules aren't observed, the old ones say, it will be disastrous and the kingdom will fall. But the need to find a chiefly heir is one thing, love is quite another. And so it is with Tanaki. Amuki is the girl he loves. But they'll never marry because her lineage is lower than his. They've known this as long as they've known one another. Here, 2,000 miles and more from the heartland of Polynesia, these descendants of ancient Polynesian seafarers still hold to ancient rules of precedence. Amuki may be Tanaki's lover, but it's Tamana's destiny to be Tanaki's wife. On this island, where everyone's worldly wealth is equal, Tamana's lineage marks her out above the others. Her father, whose hut is built of grass and leaves, like other huts on Nukumanu, walks with a quiet pride in his rank. In his eyes, and in the eyes of his wife, it's fitting his daughter should marry the chief's son. Tanaki's love for another girl means little to the family, for these are practical people, and on Nukumanu, marriage is above all a practical matter. people who knew no writing until a few years ago, yeah. a person's life is chronicled in tattoo designs. They tell the family lion and the totem they claim. They record initiations. They're pricked on the skin as objects of decoration and adornment. Tamana now adds the tattoo of Tanaki's wife and of mother-to-be. With the bone of a frigate bird and the dye from burnt nuts, these insignia are incised upon her body. Tamana will wear these chronicles of her life till the day of her death. But what will they mean in a year's time when Tanaki has gone? And Tanaki, knowing that he's leaving, yet plays his part as best he can. But he's also possessed by desires to leave and see what lies beyond Nukumanu's reef. And he knows nothing here can contain those desires. Neither the girl he'll marry once she's proved to be pregnant and fruitful, nor yet the girl who loves him. Tamana understands less than the others. For her, life is at its crest. Marriage will enhance her status in the village. She is happy, and tomorrow hardly exists. for himself and his bride, to dedicate a day of their lives to the two being joined. The plan of the house is simple. The materials are found near at hand. The timbers cut from the island's meagre forest, the posts are trunks of old coconut palms, lashed to the framework with rope they've spun themselves from the fibre of coconut husks.
coconut palm fronds are plaited for the walls. The roof comes from the leaves of pandanus palms. It's a simple house, but fitted for the climate and for the simple lives that people lead on Nukumanu. 